Um, so let's kick the Q&A night off with uh, a question. I'll start with Pastor Ryan. Pastor Ryan, what is the Bible? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, the Bible is a library. Um, it's God's revelation to us, his special and specific revelation to us. But the Bible is a library. It's organized like a library is organized. It's not organized chronologically. Um, but the Bible is God's word to us. That's the real short and sweet, simple answer. Wonderful. Thank you, brother. Uh, and we're going to stick on the topic of Bible right now, um, get into maybe a little bit of bibliology as well. And we already have a couple new questions coming in on this topic, so please keep sending those in. Um, but Dr. Marsh, we'll uh, throw this question to you. What is canon and canonization? Mm. That's a good question. So canon comes from the Greek word kanon just like as it's a transliteration, so it's spelt exactly how it sounds. And it originally meant a standard, uh, kind of like a rule, um, perhaps maybe a level, something to keep something straight. Um, it was a standard by which to measure something by. Mm. And so when we, reply, when we apply that word to the Bible, so oftentimes you'll hear the Bible called, I mean, it's, it's called, it's referred to by different names, the Word of God, a library of literature, like, like Ryan just said, um, you know, uh, I like to say it's, it's a written revelation of God, but it also times you'll hear the word canon. That's synonymous. So when we're saying the canon, we're talking about those books, those 66 books that make up our Protestant canon or canon or Protestant Bible. Um, the canon is just these are the standard books that were inspired as opposed to the apocryphal works, uh, pseudo-Gnostic works. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it that there are lost gospels, Gnostic gospels, all that nonsense, those aren't canonized scripture. That's not part of the canon. So only what's in what makes our Bible up, uh, makes up our Bible, is the standard, the rule, the canon. The canonization process, and this is important, this is where we would differ from our Roman Catholic friends, because Roman Catholicism would teach that the church is what gives the canon the authority. Um, basically, when they decided what book should be in the Bible, that's what made it authoritative. We're going to say no. The books were always authoritative. The canonization was the, origi the earliest Christians, within the first four centuries, they already recognized what books were authoritative and that were different than these other writings. Um, and so it became a standard list, if you will, a canon. The canonization process was collecting those works. So all, the difference between us and, and Rome, or Roman Catholicism, is that Protestants recognize the authority already within these books, and the canonization process was collecting them. Roman Catholicism would teach they made them authoritative when they collected them. Sort of they ordained the Bible to be authoritative, authoritative to put it in more crass terms. But yeah, so the can canon is the uh, standard word of God that we have, the, the inspired documents, and the canonization process was the collecting of, of these documents that were already recognized to be God's word. Yeah, here's some quotes on that. So Roman Catholics would say that the canon of Scripture is an authoritative collection of writings versus a biblical view says that the canon of Scripture is a collection of authoritative books. Now, there's a very, there's a very uh, nuance in that language or a careful nuance in that language. Let me read it again and see if you can pick it up on it. Roman Catholics would teach that the canon of Scripture is an authoritative collection of writings versus the biblical view is the canon of Scripture is a collection of authoritative writings. In other words, the way Roman Catholics say it is it's the church that gives the Bible its authority versus a Protestant view or an evangelical view would be, no, the books have authority in themselves because they are God's word. Does that make sense? So you're a part of a Bible church, and what that means is, is you believe that the Bible has authority over everything in the church, including the leadership of the church. Roman Catholics don't believe that. They believe that it's the church that gives the Bible its authority. So to go against a priest or the pope is worse in their minds than going against the Bible. So when I get up here on a Sunday morning and I make the statement that uh, the pope is a false teacher, I have just committed apostasy in their minds. That is saying, that's worse than saying that the Bible uh, 
uh, I reject the Bible in the mind of Roman Catholics who really understand Roman Catholic dogma. Does that make sense? So that's a practical pastoral implication maybe. Yeah, no, and, and you can see also the implications that it brings. If the church is the authority, you're going to see that play out in decision-making and teachings. If the Bible is the authority, then you'll see that same thing play itself out in the life of a church or so on and so forth. So understanding that is, it explains so much. Um, Can I say something else? Can no. I, <laughs> I wasn't going to say no, of course. <laughs> I'm sure. I would have said no. Yeah, he would have. That's why I asked Corey, the other Corey. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I asked a very well-known theologian one time about a church discipline issue we were dealing with in our church. And he said to me, he said, you know, Ryan, 95% of the guys that say they believe what we believe don't actually have the will to carry it out in the local church. And he was talking about church discipline. So he said 95% of evangelicals that would affirm on paper that church discipline is a right practice. 95% of them, he said, they don't even actually do it. Um, when we're talking about the Bible as our authority and no other man, it goes both ways. It doesn't just go the way of, hey, the Bible's my authority because God is my authority, not the church. But the other direction is, if the Bible's really authoritative, are we actually going to do what the Bible says? Or are we going to let the leadership of the church invent how we do church? We recently had practiced church discipline, and it came to my attention that some people in other churches somehow found out about it, churches in our area, and said it maybe in a tongue-in-cheek way that it wasn't the greatest thing that we did. And this would be a church that affirms on paper that they believe in church discipline, but they haven't actually carried out the practice of church discipline in their church. So if the Bible is God's word, then we are duty-bound to obey if it's really God's word. And we don't get to pick and choose what part of God's word that we obey. I, I can't emphasize that enough. It's so great to be in a Bible church but let's be the people that in faith say, we are actually going to submit to what this book says. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, well, staying on the same thing theme, um, but getting into a little bit more on languages and translations, can we truly know God's word without knowing the original languages? And I'll direct that to you, Dr. Marsh. Uh, yeah, simple answer is, of course. Um, one of the amazing things about what makes this particular holy text different from all the quote-unquote holy text of all the great religions, be it Judaism, Islam, which are the great monothe monotheistic faiths along with Christianity, and all the other types of uh, religions out there, whether the Upanishads of Hinduism or the Eightfold Plan of Buddhism, whatever it may be, their, their sacred texts, uh, in Sikhism, it was their book called the Guru Granth Sahib. So everybody has a holy text for their particular religion. Only the Bible is written in multiple languages. So there's two, technically three, mm -hmm. that combines both hemispheres of the world. Right? So it's a truly remarkable thing, which makes this text, when you hear people say, oh, the Bible's you know, written by a bunch of men, it's just like any other religious text. It's absolutely not. You can put every other book on the same shelf, the Bible goes on a different shelf for various reasons, one being that it's written in an ancient uh, language from the East, uh, a classic ancient Oriental language, which is Hebrew, and an Indo-European uh, Western language, which is Greek. Both languages are perfectly translatable, probably the most translatable of any language, at least that I know of, into other dialects. So God's word is preserved uh, through faithful translation. And that would be different from other religions that would say, no, you need to come to us. You need to come to the original Arabic to understand Allah's word given in the Quran. They would look at translations of that in English as very subpar. Um, we would say God's word is God's word in English, just as much as it is in Chinese or Korean or Greek or Hebrew. Um, so to answer the question, no. 
we don't need to know the original languages to truly understand God's word. God, God transcends his, his word, transcends all cultures, all language barriers, and we would think it should if it's truly God's revelation yeah. given to mankind, right? Yeah. Pastor, anything to add to that? Yeah, that, that question um, also falls under the theological idea of the clarity of Scripture or the perspicuity of Scripture. The idea is that God wants us to know him. God's not playing a game of hide and seek with anybody in the world. And so to say, the, one of the implications of saying that you can only know God's word by knowing the original languages is to essentially say that then God is then cut off to some degree from people that don't understand those original languages. But it's part of God's character where he, he wants us to intelligibly know him. And not just us, he wants all people to intelligibly know him so thank you brother well on on this note um a question to you dr marsh from our audience dr marsh stand up whoever answers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and and it's the only one directed to anyone so far so if you would like it to be directed to so, to either pastor ryan or dr marsh please uh write that in your question. But Corey, why do you personally believe the Bible is true? Mm. Why do I personally believe the Bible is true? Well, um, I can rattle off 50 different apologetic reasons of evidence that are logical propositions that would move me toward why this particular text is different than every other's and move from there than making a step backward toward the God who it is. Ultimately, I'm going to say that, just like any of us in the room, the reason why we, at the last stop, the buck stops with God opening our eyes. Why we know this is the Bible, why I know this is the Bible, is because Jesus saved me. Amen. And I have eyes of faith. Um, at the end of Luke 24, I believe it is, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, and they don't know who he is. And there's this incredible text that says around verse 40, 44, 46, around there, that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and that's when they finally saw him. It's remarkable. I think that same phenomenon still happens today, uh, maybe not in such a dramatic fashion. We're, we're walking with Jesus, and he opens our eyes right there. Uh, but every time we're reading scripture, once you're regenerated and have the eyes of faith, you can see things in scripture that, the, quite simply, the non-believer cannot. Um, you, care things about, you care about things in scripture that the non-believer doesn't. So ultimately, I believe my answer would be because Christ saved me and gave me the eyes to be able to understand it. Outside of that, like I said, we can go into all these different reasons for the uniqueness of Scripture. I've mentioned a few already, the, the different languages, how they're translated, the different genres are in this that are not in, say, the Quran. Um, there aren't miracles in other works. There's no prophecy in other works, like the, the holy texts of, uh, of Sikhism, uh, for example. Um, you know, there, the difference of this particular text than other religious texts is quite remarkable. And it can only be attested to a divine mind behind it. How do you come up with multiple literary genres spread out over 1,500 years on three different continents, written in three different languages from people that didn't know each other 100 years apart, from kings down to fishermen, writing the same thing? You know, where there's a plumb line going through all of it, there is a problem. We have separated from God through sin. There's a solution in Christ, and then we'll be restored, and the, and the consummation's coming. You can't... You can't make that up. And if you were to make that up, then you wouldn't have things in the text that condemn you. For example, you're going into your place of wickedness if you aren't repenting or trusting Christ. Why would you write that? Yeah. Um, you have things like, for example, the triune, the doctrine of the Trinity. It's something that man cannot make up. It had to be revealed. I mean, think about just the resurrection of Christ, what we're actually saying, how offensive that is. It's offensive to Jews because we're saying a, an itinerant preacher from Galilee who was not an official rabbi knew more than all the rabbis, and died for sin. So according to them, that's a scandal on. That's a scandal. Then you're saying to the Greeks that someone who's not even a philosopher, one of their trained philosophers, also took on the sin of the world to, to restore them as well, to make them righteous. So it's an offense to them. These types of truths about Christ revealed in Scripture is not something that could have been made up. It had to be revealed because it's so ridiculous. The resurrection had to happen because it's so impossible. You wouldn't make it up. 
And when people try to try try to uh, draw parallels between other text and other mythology, where there are certain resurrections that have happened throughout time, it's all bogus. Nothing reads like the Gospels. Nothing reads like a like a newspaper like Luke wrote, just coming out with dates and kings' names and who was in office of the high priest. It reads like a newspaper. That's just not in a religious text or these myth you know mythological texts that critics will 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 try to find parallels with. Um, anyways, I mean, you can go on and on and on. This is within bibliology, but at the end of the day, um, our job, my job, is never to convince anybody that the Bible is the Word of God. I'm not going to submit the authority of the Word of God to a non-believer who doesn't have eyes to see anyways. My job is to proclaim the truth of it and pray God opens their eyes. Aren't you glad Dr. Marsh is at our church? Yeah, that, that, that just so you know, that's where you drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, what, I love, what I love about Corey is is he's a guy that's got more degrees than Fahrenheit, but he believes... And the debt to prove it. And the debt to prove it. <laughs> he, he believes uh, in Jesus Christ, and that's why he's dedicated his life to this book. Um, so I love Corey for that, really do. He really believes what he teaches. I think it's... Thank you for that. I appreciate that, brother. I... This is one of those things that goes into, and it should give us confidence. I'm thinking about when you're talking about Mike Gendron coming out, who's got an amazing ministry of evangelizing Roman Catholics. Oftentimes, Christians don't want to evangelize because we think we need to know more before we go out. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to be challenged or stumped by that one question. If you only had that one answer, then maybe that person would come to Christ. Or you didn't say the right buzzwords when evangelizing. All of that is nonsense. There's not a single canned presentation of the gospel anywhere in the New Testament. It's spoken of in different ways. God saves people despite our bad efforts. You know, you get the message of Christ out. Jesus died for sins. You're a sinner, trust in him. Boom, your job is done. The rest is on, is on God's side. You know, to, the results are his. You just plant the seed. And that should bolster our confidence. And it's the same thing of why the Bible is true. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to presuppose it, and I'm not embarrassed by that. Yeah. I got a phone call today from a friend who's evangelizing a family member. And they said, hey, here's the situation. How do I evangelize them? And my response was, well, the same way you evangelize anyone. And the reason for that is because Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Think about that for a minute. The gospel is the power of God. The power is not in our presentation or in how smooth our words are. The gospel itself is powerful. And sometimes we forget that so many Christians that go to, we live in Orange County and a lot of people in Orange County go to church, right? And so we assume that because they go to church, they know the gospel. The gospel is lost in a lot of evangelicalism. And when you share the gospel with people, the, we get it all the time at our church. People will come in and they'll be like, oh my goodness, I've never knew that there was Bible teaching like this. And we're not doing anything new. We're not doing anything. By the way, there's a lot of churches around the world that are doing just what we're doing. There's just so many that aren't in today's world. So that's why we, we look increasingly novel, quote unquote, but we're not. We're actually doing what the Bible tells us to do, to preach the word in season and out of season. But in that, people hear the gospel and they come up constantly and say, I, I didn't, I've been in church my whole life and I'd never heard that before. The gospel itself, God has chosen to make the message of the gospel powerful. Not because you have a degree, not because you're really good with your words, but just the gospel. Don't ever forget that when you're sharing with unbelievers. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Well, and to speak to what you pointed out there, Pastor Ryan, because I've heard the same thing numerous times. I've never heard that before. This is so different. That goes back to the very first question or answer that we were giving that here we just hold to the authority of scripture and so we just stay in exegeting out what the text says yeah we're trying at revolve bible church we're we're all growing all in process myself and the elders included but there is this especially you especially me (laughs) there is a conviction at our church that says that because the bible is the word of god we're trying our very best not just to unleash what it says but to align our lives practically to what it says. I, there's so many places you can go to that will teach the Bible accurately, but then 
they're not encouraging their people to actually be doers of the word and aligning their life. Or you can be in a legalistic church is encouraging people to just do a ton of things, but it's totally divorced from the actual exposition of Scripture. We don't do it perfectly, but we're trying. And I think that's, that's an unmistakable, or that's, an, that's, a, that's a, a conviction that we hold that will never, ever change. And the day that it does is the day we should close our doors. Well, I'd like to get on to a new topic on biblical literacy because we're starting to get um, quite a few questions on that topic. So to start this section out, Dr. Marsh, I uh, want to direct this question to you. You discovered during your research, and I hear this podcast after podcast that you're in, um, doing your research, uh, you state in some ways that we can grow in our awareness and proficiency of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's right there is what the entire book is addressing. Um, so a couple lectures ago, a couple learnings ago, whatever you want to call it, um, I had put some different uh, examples of, of books called biblical literacy and using that term. And each one of them uses the term differently, just about virtually. Surprised because when Pastor Ryan first asked me to write the, the blog, it was supposed to just be one blog. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is biblical literacy? I'm like, oh, that's simple until, you know, the academic in me tries to find sources and bounce off ideas, different scholars and other published works, and it's not something that's defined, even in the dictionary of biblical literacy, you know, funny enough. Uh, so, and then I had to go out on a limb and go, okay, I'm going to have to contribute something that will be critiqued, and it already has, um, about defining how, what is biblical literacy, and so I give a unique definition by two key terms, which was just brought up in the, in the question, awareness and proficiency, and what I mean by that is, we don't read Scripture, first of all, just to grow in our knowledge of Scripture. We read Scripture to grow closer to God, first and foremost. That's always should be the goal. And so by awareness, I meant we grow in our awareness of what he's revealed. That's the growing and proficiency part. Appreciated, which I didn't. He looked at what I said in describing uh, growing. Maybe I'm dancing around it with different language. I should be more direct, so maybe I'll revise that in, a, in another edition. But still, literacy, you know, just, hey, we need more, be more literate in Scripture, just like it sounds. Well, we've got to make distinctions. What are these things? I'm going, to tr- I'm going to take it all the way back to the source, which is question, but I, I, basically growing in one's awareness of the presence of God through Scripture by discerning Scripture's meaning and how to do that was the whole point of chapter 3, and it's woefully short. Um, and the one session I did here was radically short, and it was just you know, kind of like drinking from a fire hose, I said that night when we were talking about different hermeneutical techniques. But hermeneutics, interpreting scripture, there, is, there are rules, and it is an art. Um, there are standards to go by, observation, interpretation, application, history, literature, and theology. So we don't just open the scripture, put it on a dartboard, throw a dart and say, okay, what does God want me to read today, and come up with my own meaning. There's actually authorial intent. What did the original writer mean? And my goal, our goal as scripture readers, is to get to that intended meaning. Never reach that fine practicals. Yeah, please. First, you just got, and he wants you so busy that you have no time to actually read it. Yeah. Sometimes we don't read it because we don't get a word from God, right? You're reading it, it's like, I don't feel like God's speaking to me. Well, he's not. He wasn't written to you. <laughs> it's the principles. It's the, it's the uh, P word. What am I looking for? Uh, the... Yeah, <laughs> uh, something. I thought you were a scholar. Um, I don't know what's go- what marbles are rolling around yeah, in your yeah, head, yeah. man. So there's a uh, <laughs> preposition. It's the prepositions, the prepositional truth. Proposition. Propositions. Thank you. See, I was looking for <laughs> not prepositions. Okay. So busy. We those of you with kids, you got to spend double duty trying to pin a book, and it contains all we need for life and godliness. The first step is read. Second thing is, you need to be involved in church. You need to have a church that's faithfully committed to exposition, but we're a Bible church. Everything we do at Revolve Bible Church is geared toward helping you become biblically literate. Ladies, our woman's Bible study this year is, is an inductive Bible study. If you're a lady and you're not going to our women's ministry, you, it literally, it's separated into groups, and the ladies get in little small groups, and in fellowship, they inductive, they're learning inductive Bible study, and they're doing it together. Um, our men's discipleship group, it's a discussion led through a, word, a, a book that's committed to expositing certain issues. 
Um, everything that we do is geared to helping you be built. Your children right now, they're, they're getting doctrine. On Sunday mornings, they're getting, uh, they're getting scripture. Um, everything we do at Revolve Bible Church is based. Corey says in his book, and I love this point. It's so simple, but it's profound. He, he calls it the X factor in biblical literacy is fellowship. When you're around a group of people that love the Lord, it stirs us up to love and good deeds. One of the effects that happens when you're around, when you're around a lot of people that don't really care about the Bible, you're going to find yourself not really caring about the Bible. But when you're around a lot of people that really care about the Bible, we stir one another up to love and good deeds, and we find ourselves wanting to know the Bible more. It really is an X factor in biblical literacy. When we are committed to a local fellowship that's committed to the exposition of Scripture, we fire our, uh, each other up. Um, uh, Darlene, I'm going to highlight you if you don't mind. Uh, I didn't ask her permission to do this, so I'm risking it here. <laughs> Darlene comes up to me on Sunday after service, and she said, you know, you made that point, and I was about ready to stand up in my chair and say, Amen! <laughs> And when Darlene said that to me, you know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to go study and preach better next Sunday. It fires me up that she's fired up about the truth of God's word. And so as we're fellowshipping with each other, it's encouraging us to keep going, keep expositing the word of God, keep getting it out there. Fellowship is such a key component um, to biblical literacy. So, sorry, because um, something that you commented on about the influence of the people that are around us, we, but the reality is, is the way Jesus Christ has called us to walk. True fellowship is the real X factor. Art, and then Dr. Marsh, please follow. Do you really see a difference in people's lives based on their biblical literacy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, um, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I am a completely... Um, four or five years ago was my 20-year high school reunion. I didn't go. Nobody would recognize me. Nobody. I, I, am, I am radically different than I was that word the more it's upon truth, upon truth, year after year after year. Yeah. All of a sudden, their relationships with their family is strained. Well, you're different because the Word of God has renewed your mind. And that renewing of your mind has impacted the way that you're living your life. And so you unknowingly have become salt and light, and you make everyone around you uncomfortable. Because now all of a sudden, you're this shining light in a dark world. And people in the world, they don't know what to do with us. It... It, it's funny, like, when I meet new people, I don't like to, people to find out that I'm a pastor. Because as soon as they find out I'm a pastor, they treat me different. It's, it's funny, like, instantly. Even the gym I work out at, Faraz's gym, gym all call me Pastor Ryan, whether or not they're Christian. The experiential factor of a transformed life after getting saved and understanding Scripture is one of the greatest apologetics for the truth of Scripture. And you see it within the New Testament, its own witness. For example, the disciples are terrified when Jesus is on the cross. They flee. Um, Peter had just denied him three times. Um, they're left in this state of trauma and confusion. And yet when they see the resurrected Christ, everything changes. Yeah. They're no longer cowards. The next time G, uh, Peter sees Jesus, he's not running away from him to hang himself like Judas. He's jumping off the boat running to Christ, and he's reinvigorated. Um, all the disciples are, and they all went to their deaths proclaiming the truth of Christ. Um, the, it's impossible, to Ryan's point, it is absolutely impossible to stay the same. Once you're a Christian and you grow in your biblical literacy, the more you understand and grow in your awareness of God— and what he expects of us, and how loving he is to save wretched sinners like us. And then work on us. And continue, yeah, and continue to where it's, the gospel is just the tip of the iceberg. Oftentimes we think, well, you know, the gospel gets you saved, and then the rest is on, on you, right? 
And that was the very problem in Galatians three. Who who were was, you've been you've been saved and now you're being perfected on in your own flesh after you've been you know received the Spirit. It's not the gospel saves the non-believer, but the gospel also keeps the believer saved. We need the gospel constantly preached to us, understanding it more, understanding the implications, living it out, um, just as much as a non-believer needs it, but in a different sense. Uh, the gospel has preserving power in that, and so. Going back to your point of Romans 116, the gospel is the power of salvation. It doesn't end once you get saved. That's just the very beginning. Now it becomes, who is this Jesus who I'm following? What is his word? Oh, there's a, there's a Bible? Oh, there's different books in the Bible? Oh, it's, it, it, it's this journey that never ends. It's an adventure of coming to know the God who so radically loved us to send his son to die for us. Knowing that message that cannot be made up, you're like, how can I stay the same? You know, hearing your stories and how bad you were, uh, I, I, me too. My wife can attest to that. She knew me from high school on, you know. She knows all my secrets. Shannon, you want to comment on some no, of those? No, she doesn't. <laughs> she wants to stay where she's at. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'd be here all night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it's the same thing. I actually have videotapes. When I was a musician, I was in a band back in the day, and, and I've seen these old VHS tapes of me playing and the way I'm speaking and the way I'm talking. I mean, it's just... I can't, I can't even look at it. It's, it's atrocious. It makes me want to cry. I'm like, that's not even me. That is such an old man. And then there's parts of me that's like, I feel like I'm still snapping on my heels. Like I can be that at any moment again. I need the gospel. I need to be refreshed in Christ. I need to be refreshed in his word. It, it, it's, it's a constant process. I remember reading something from Francis Schaeffer. He says something like, you know, the faith, and he didn't mean this as in you'll lose your salvation. He meant growing in your confidence in Christ. The faith you have at morning, you know, doesn't keep you till the end of the day. It needs to be renewed by lunchtime. That faith at lunchtime needs to be renewed by, you know, by late afternoon. That faith needs to be, re- I mean, it's, we're never off the clock and never want to be. Because the moment I'm away from this and the moment I'm away from fellowship, I am a wreck on my own, you know. Um, praise God, he's got me in his graces. Well, I'll never return to that man again. And I do that, and I understand that banking on his grace but I know if that grace wasn't there, it would it, in a snap, I'd be back to what I, how I was before. All of us would. Um, and so just knowing that, you know, uh, uh, anyways, to go back to the, to, the, to, the, to the question, growing in your biblical literacy, I just I don't see it any other way than to be changed in some aspect. And if you're not changed in some aspect, and that's a double-edged sword because it's not calling to – some people try to list out all their spiritual victories throughout the year. I had a friend that would do that, and it just by the end of the year it looked like this ridiculous, you know, CV, a big resume of all his wonderful <laughs> victories, and it looked almost bra- you know braggadocious, if you will. That, no, it's usually other people that say something about you know I've noticed you you're reacting differently now about this, or your knowledge in this has grown, or your desires are different. Usually, other people are the ones that are confirming you of that, as opposed to internally looking at yourself because. It, if I look at myself, I feel like Paul, at the end of his ministry, I am the chief of sinners. Mm-hmm. And he said that toward the end of his ministry. He didn't say that at the beginning. And you're thinking, Paul, you wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. What are you talking about? And it's in 1 Timothy when he says he's the chief of sinners. And it's like, man, I can so relate to that. So I don't, I don't, I don't want a chip. I don't want a little medal saying that, hey, I've been a Christian for 25 years now or five years. I don't want any of that because it's like that's exactly what the enemy will use against us. And, and think that we've reached some, or at least for me, reached some you know, peak, and I'm good now. Absolutely not. It, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. Whether, uh, to your point earlier, whether you have multiple degrees or you don't, everybody, all of us here who are Christians, we encourage one another. We have to. And fresh one another in Scripture and in the Gospel. And we should never become isolated from one another. One of the things that I love about Corey, um, and I, this is worth saying, um, Every Corey, how many podcasts have you done now on biblical literacy? Uh, well, I, I don't know. Um, I have another one next week scheduled. <laughs> I know that. Ten? Uh, I don't know. I have no. I honestly I have no idea. Every I'm not week, counting. Corey sent me text. Here's a podcast yeah. I did, and I've listened to all of them. And on every podcast, Corey talks about with with great affection that he serves as scholar in residence at Revolt Bible Church. Now, the people on the podcast, they just want to talk about his degrees and where he's a seminary <laughs> professor. Now, he talks highly of his seminary, too, because he really believes in what they're doing at the seminary, which is great. Um, Corey really, his passion, that I, one of the things I love about him is he really doesn't want to be an ivory tower academic. He really wants to be with God's people. 
Um, but And there are in the academia, in biblical academia, there are a lot of ivory tower guys that are out there. Um, so, brother, just just a big thank you to you. So it really thanks, it man. Really I, really I appreciate that. So, and me personally. Thank you. Um, but I, I, I feel the benefits all on my side because I, you know, we, just we a, give you snow cones. And we got some. Yeah. I mean, last time I had one of those, I put in like 12 flavors at once and it turned black. And <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't taste any of it. I'm like, I was done with snow cones until I saw that truck. <laughs> And uh, Stacy guilted me into getting a snow cone right before we started because I was trying to stay away from it. Was it one color? It was well, it was one color, but it was two flavors: pina colada Look and the blue your, one. Your growth is yeah. being made exactly. evident. Exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, well, t- one more thing on this, and this is this is certainly not to my praise in any sense because I need it. Just this morning, I met with several men um, here at the church, and I've been able to do that a couple times on Wednesday with Dave and, and Don and Chris this morning and Jack and Mike back there and Joe it's it's been I've had to force myself to leave the study you know and leave early because I'm thinking in my mind I have so many I'm in the middle of research on a conference paper I'm doing I have classes coming up I'm preparing lectures and before I know it I can look at the clock and I'm in my office you know for nine hours of the day you know I've got you know when and yell down the house I and mean, down the floor you know down the first floor honey are you still live down there because I think I am up I don't know if I still am or whatever um, and so getting these invitations and Dave every single week you know we'll, we'll send out a text to several of the guys and and uh, you know it's hard for me to make it down there but I have to and I, and I was telling Shannon this like I need fellowship because I know that my flesh doesn't want it I have every justifiable excuse to stay in my study um, and if, but I know at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, well, that's a war in my spirit. I need to be around Christian men. I need to be around seasoned Christian men. I need to be able to have fellowship and talking with these guys who, who I absolutely love and, you know, who are dear in this church and let that just be somewhat of an encouragement to everybody here that we should make time, even if it's not formalized fellowship, uh, make time for those, those, those moments of discipleship, because that's, what's going to count the most, you know? Um, I've already enjoyed several personal conversations, even, even with Dave, after, you know, everybody's gone and I didn't even expect to talk about something and a little issue I'm having or something, what we, we pray for, something like that, you know? Those things happen. Whether it's you and I getting a coffee or, or several of us getting coffee together. I mean, th- those types of things, we should, never, we should never divorce ourselves from the benefits. One of the wonderful, to use a, a, a secular term, one of the perks of being a Christian is that we're never alone. We have other believers here to help bear our burdens, and we need to take advantage of that. Christ died for all of us, not just one person individually. And the spirit in each one of us is like a magnet. We, we, we grow, we should be flocking to one another for encouragement and discipleship and accountability. Thank you, brother. I think what you just explained right there just, just took further your line of fellowship as the X factor. Right. right? We it's, need... Uh, until glory, that is something that we need, and then we have a whole new fellowship. It's interesting how that's not discussed in these types of conversations. So I, I, in the back of the book, I referred so many wonderful tools, resources, aids on hermeneutics, bibliology, um, even the ones on biblical literacy. And that particular notion of being in a church under the expos- faithful expository preaching and being with, in fellowship is it's not. It's the X factor. I mean, it's probably the most important. Not just one of the tools God's given us. It's it's the most to grow in our knowledge of Scripture and our awareness of, of God. Thank you, brother. Pastor Ryan, question coming your way. There we go. Do you think our church is biblically literate as a whole? Um, so glad that question's for him. <laughs> I really do. I really do. My concern for our church is we're not doing enough with what we know. Um, I think we have to be careful. So I think part of what attracts people to our church is biblical literacy. We get it all the time. People come in and they say, I just, I want to know the Bible better. But to Corey's point in his book, we have to not make knowing the book the end. It's about knowing God. And when we know God, you have to understand 
that God is God and he puts demands on your life. The God that we love and the God that we serve is a God who commands us. Knowing God involves duty and doing. And I think sometimes we forget that. Um, you, you, sometimes when you, when you see the church in other parts of the world, they have so little Bible knowledge, but they have so much doing. And when you see the church in America, there's so much Bible knowledge and so little doing. I think part of that is we're distracted. We're so busy with a lot of other stuff. And we sometimes give ourselves a pass that we don't have to be doers, like Scripture says. John Piper wrote a book, and it's called, um, he wrote a lot of books, a lot of good books. One of them is called What Jesus Demands of the World. And it's literally just a book, it's a thick book, of every single command that he could find in the New Testament of what Jesus demands of the church. It's worth getting. And you just go through that book, and it's like, wow, Jesus expects a lot from me. But when you actually have a fellowship that's built around not just knowing information, but expecting people to actually come underneath the Lordship of Christ, that's the part that people don't like. It's, we, we, there's, this, there's not a whole lot of threat in, uh, in growing in our understanding, but then there's a whole lot of threat in hearing, but you better respond. Um, I don't think that's a concern for our church because I think we're really bad at it. I think it's a concern for our church just because I'm a pastor and God has put in me a pastor's heart. And so I'm always concerned with what people know and what people are doing. But I think we know a lot. Um, like, you know, the, the, we, I think sometimes we, we cherry pick what we're supposed to do and not do. And I, I just think that, and I do that. And I think that that's something that the Lord doesn't want his church to do. So that's my answer. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, no, I, I think it's encouraging from our teaching pastor to say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, on one hand, I'm, I'm really happy at what I'm seeing. On the other hand, I can't stop. Yeah, and, and let me maybe define doing I don't, I don't so much mean doing stuff for our church. I mean all the little tiny things when no one's looking, the things that the Holy Spirit is telling you to be faithful to in your heart. You guys are, our church is incredible as far as the involvement is concerned. We, we, most of the things that get done here are done by volunteers who give a lot of their time and energy to our church. You guys, you're really what keeps Revolve Bible Church going, so thank you. So I don't necessarily, I'm not, this, that's not my plea to say you need to do more for the church. It's more just that internal, as we're learning, saying, you know, like one of the things that I'm praying, we're coming up on this section in Galatians, where, he, where we're going to be commanded, where Paul commands the church in Galatia, and by inference, us, we're a church, we're a biblical church, he's going he's gonna to command us, the Holy Spirit is going to command us to walk in the Spirit, which means to put to death the deeds of the flesh. This Paul uses, says that in Romans. And as we go through the deeds of the flesh, we're all going to, there's a list, there's eight lists. There's a big list, but in the middle, there's eight social sins. Eight ways we sin against each other. And I've been reading through that list, and I've been asking the Lord, are we actually going to change that? Am I actually going to change that in my own life? See, it's, I, we're going to have a Sunday, and I'm literally going to give you tons of definitions of what all the words mean. But are we actually going to put to death those deeds of the flesh in our families, in our friendships, in our church life? But that's, that's it's just a two. Uh, it's just because I know that God wants the information to actually change the way we live. Then we're really being salt and light. Great. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Uh, we are down to our last 15 minutes. And so I would like to, uh, 
we'll start with you, Pastor Aaron. How does the authority of Scripture impact the life of Revolved Bible Church? Uh, yeah, I think I jumped on that one a little earlier. Yeah. Maybe you can talk to, just as a church plan, how that's worked its way out. Yeah, yeah just in everything. I mean, I, we could just kind of shotgun this, but, well, here's a story. I, uh, not too long ago, I, I preached at a men's breakfast, and a young man drove from a great distance to come to the men's breakfast, and he walked up to me afterwards, and he says, um, hey, my, my friends are telling me that I should become a pastor. And I said, oh, you know, that's, that's great. And he said, I just have one question. I can't remember how the conversation went, but he, the question he ended up getting. And I looked at him, and I encouraged him not to go to seminary and to get involved in a church that's committed to expository preaching. One of the ways that the authority of Scripture impacts our church is in the preaching. He, this young man was struck by what he perceived as me having confidence in the things that I was saying to the men. And he was right. What he perceived was right. I really do believe that the Bible, the reason, the reason why you, not you, you, I say you deal with, um, you, I get so fired up about some of the things that I say and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get elevated in my voice or my face will turn red. I'm not mad at you guys. I just really believe that this is authoritative. And I don't want to communicate it in a way that gives anyone the impression that it's not. That, hey, you know, this is good stuff. You can do it if you want. I want you, I want me to feel that this is the authority of God. But we want that to play out not just in the preaching. We, we are real careful in our song selection in our church. And part of the reason for that is we want the songs to be biblical. We want the songs to be under the authority of Scripture. We work in our children's ministry to make sure that our teachers are only teaching the Bible because we want the kids to get the authority of Scripture. Across the board, we're working to, to put ourselves underneath the authority of Scripture. That's why I said we're not perfect, but we're working at it. So to answer the question, how does the authority of Scripture impact the life? It, everything. We, us as elders, when we're thinking about making decisions, we don't think about what do we want. We default to what does the Bible say. Yeah. Um, and we do that because of the conviction that the Bible is God's authoritative, inerrant word. Yeah, yeah and I can speak to that just on, I mean, numerous situations we found in ourselves in as elders. It has not been, well especially with your role, the main teaching pastor, what does Ryan say? It, that's not our go-to as elders. It's what does Scripture say? It is not what, what does Ben say? What does Dave say? What does Jake or Corey say? It is what does the Scripture say about this? And then we collectively come and make a decision. By the way, that's why you can disagree with me. And you can disagree with Corey. Corey and I have disagree, small disagreements and things. Um, it's because it's not... It's not his well, we can all agree with you, but then we'd all be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, Just kidding. What gives, I read that off a pair of socks I bought. That yeah, was cheesy. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> we, Corey doesn't have authority because he has a PhD in some of these things. Now, in, a, in some ways, he does. He's an authority. Corey knows way more Greek than I know. So he is a source of authority. Sometimes I'll say, hey, did I get that pronunciation right? Or... You know, was my understanding of the syntax right or, you know, help me understand how this conjunction works here or something that Corey and I will talk. So in a sense, he's an authority. He has more education and understanding in that area than I do in a lot of areas. But it's not a th he doesn't possess authority because he's got a Ph.D. And it doesn't mean he is inerrant. So I can question him. I can say, you know, yeah, you got a Ph.D., but. I'm going to question that. It doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't, and you guys can do that to me. And we want that to happen at our church. We don't want to create an environment where we're all just bickering because we can't understand something. But we do want to have this environment where it's like, if you hear me say something you disagree with, come say it. Like, hey, Pastor Ryan, I just, I'm not tracking with you on that. And people do that, and that's great because it, re it reminds me and it reinforces the fact that I'm not the authority. Corey Marsh is not the authority. Um, in the sense that everything that we say is inerrant and you have to do it. So, yeah, that's great. Um, 
Dr. Marsh, we'll uh, ask you this one. We have 10 minutes, so there will probably be one last question that we'll roll in. Uh, but you speak often of your love of the local church. Where do you think that comes from, especially with how much time you are forced to spend outside of the local church at times with your studies, your conferences, your job? Where do you believe that your love for the local church derives from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because as everybody in this room knows, church life is messy. <laughs> um, you know, people just bug you sometimes. A lot of them are in the church. You know? Some of them sit next to me. <laughs> uh, so there, <laughs> that's one of the amazing things about the church is that we are all unlovable people uh, that God loves. And therefore, we have to demonstrate that love of an invi to our invisible God that we cannot see by how we love those made in his image and that are regenerated who we can see. It's one of those wonderful things of how we show the love of God. But um, there is a scripture that always stuck out to me, and, I, and I've tried to keep it in mind even through all my seminary days, all my, um, you know, my academic life, all of that. I, I was always, yes, I was always, since I got saved, a, a churchman at heart. Um, whether it's preaching or counseling or just discipleship, uh, I want to be around God's people always. Um, that doesn't mean all the time, but like I mentioned earlier, sometimes I don't want to, but I have to force myself. And when I feel that tug of don't be with God's people, I'm thinking that's not from the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I should go and, and, and enjoy some fellowship. But in Ephesians chapter 3, there's a, there's a couple verses here that say... Um, in verse, starting in verse 10, well, I'll, I'll back up, verse 8, Ephesians 3, 8 to 11. It says, to me, Paul says, though I am very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach th to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring delight for everyone that is the plan, really dispensation, it's the word, or economia, of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, verse 10, so that, Hina in the Greek, a purpose clause, for the purpose of, or in order that, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal plan that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's saying some pretty remarkable things here about the church. Um, off the bat, very low rung on the ladder, it is through the church, the manifold diamond, if you will, wisdom of God is shown to angelic beings, both demons and angels. They look at the church to see God's wisdom. And they're like, wow, there's nothing on earth that compares to the spiritual body we call the church. Jew and Gentile together, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, serving the same God. Um, he's making it very clear, Paul's making it very clear to him in this particular economy dispensation. God is acting in the world through the church. And so when you study world history, if you just see what's going on in the local church in these areas, it's pretty remarkable that it's what's happening at the church and God's word being preached in a language of the culture that's affecting that culture that turns into our studies of history. Um, God is working through the church in ways that just shine his manifold wisdom. And it, as he says in verse 11, this was according to his eternal purpose. Oftentimes the church, even by people of my own tradition, of you know, dispensationalist camp, will describe the church as a parenthesis. And I never liked that. And I know what they're saying because it's a dispensation that's sort of within another dispensation or it's one that God was working with Israel and now this, this new thing that was never known in the Old Testament is happening and then it's going to go back to Israel. But this idea of a parenthesis is like an afterthought. And it says clearly in verse 311, the church was always part of God's eternal plan. Even when there's nothing in the Old Testament that specifically says this is going to happen, there's always this idea, the purview is leading to that, that there's going to be a redeemed people. There's going to be Gentiles who are going to be bringing revelation even to Jews. Um, these things that are just mysterious in the Old Testament work out in the New Testament through the church. And so if we understand the church as such a high and holy place, the most holy place on earth, used to be the temple in Jerusalem. It's no longer there. The temple is now the body of the Christian. And the way that we experience this tangibly, concretely, is together in fellowship like we are right now, that the worldwide body of Christ is manifested in these local assemblies, that where we are in the local church, even at Revolved Bible Church, is the full expression, if you will, of God's church right here, then this is holy ground. You know, I'm in a place that 
you know, it's a, it's a battlefield to demons because they don't know what to do with this. They're looking at us in the church, seeing the wisdom of God. And it's a, an encouragement for all of us believers that we're in a safe haven, a safe place, um, much like a shark cage, you know, underwater. It's like there are sharks all around us, but they can't get to us. You know, it is, it is a high and holy place that we are. And so if, going back to Ryan's point, if we see the authority of Scripture, we understand Scripture, this is Paul saying with authority, it is through the church that God's brilliance manifold wisdom is even blowing away spiritual beings, then we should have a view of the church. And I try to have to the question, I try to have that view of the church that never get too familiar with being here, never come to revolve or whatever your local church should be. But for us, it's revolve and just be too familiar with everybody here where this place is just one more thing you do on Sunday. This is a holy, terrifying, wonderfully encouraging place where God is working and, and, and reflecting his manifold wisdom to spiritual beings all around us that we can't see. Wow, that... <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. That's the mic drop one, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, there's been a couple. All right, let's start... And picking. I even got chill saying that, and I'm not charismatic at all. <laughs> because we're sitting under the AC. <laughs> <laughs> you got that behind you. Right? Yeah. So, but I, I, you bring something up, Dr. Marsh, that I, I really need to hit on. How, how do we combat becoming familiar with the church? The same way that we don't ever let the good news just become the old news. You know, that's another thing. The gospel can just become, we become so familiar with it. We can so, become so familiar with the Bible. Uh, one of the sessions, I put a bunch of pictures up and how we've trivialized scripture. We've turned it into t-shirts and hats and and there's a lot of good in that. I don't want to sit there and just, you know, cause all kind, you know, not trying to trash the whole thing, but we've merchandised out the gospel of grace to death when it comes down to it. And so we're very familiar with things about the Bible without a firsthand knowledge of scripture ourselves. And I think a lot of that is not only are we too busy, as Ryan brings up, which is most certainly one of the reasons, but I would say we've become too familiar. Um, and that right there is destruction. The moment we become to, uh, how about this? I, 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 get, I get blown away studying just the Gospels, and speci- specifically John. But you look at the disciples. They're spending time with Jesus for probably three and a half years, and we know that because in only in the Gospel of John, Jesus visit, goes to the Passover three times. That's where we get this idea that three years of ministry. We don't know for sure. It could have been longer because there's only three talked about in John, but it seems to match with the with the, the time period that Luke gives us as well when Jesus was about 30 when he started. So let's just say three to three and a half years, the disciples were with Jesus just about every day. And all the way to the end, I mean, they're with them all the time. All the way to the end, they never get comfortable with him. He never becomes that celebrity that when you know a famous person to everybody else, that's so crazy until you know the person. It's like, oh, it's just my buddy. I've known since high school or something like that. That doesn't happen with the disciples. All the way to the very end where Jesus is saying he's going to depart and go to the Father in John 13 in the Upper Room Discourse, and they are freaking out. They can't imagine a world where Jesus is not in their presence, and there weren't, they weren't understanding that, which he's going to tell them. He's going to come back to receive them, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit. But they, got, they were with him for so long, Never being, never being comfortable is my point. And even, and even the parts where they're, they, actually there's none that I can think of where they, they, they just get so comfortable with them, they don't. So having that perspective, if we say we follow Jesus, we should never let him get old to us. And the moment that we're dry in our understanding of Christ, and I've been there, um, you know, all the time, it happens to all of us Christians. It's one of those times that we pray, God, please restore to me the joy of my salvation. You know, I know you're here. I want to cry out, Abba, Father. But, I, I, but I, I'm having a dry season. I feel dry. Where is your presence? But I know you're here. Those types of things, those are crisis points for the Christian faith that is not uncommon. It's in those moments that you don't isolate yourself. It's in those moments that you pray, you read Scripture, you, you, you come to church, you're in fellowship. You know, these are classic, ancient uh, uh, tools that God's given us to grow closer to him, fair prayer, f- fellowship, and, and scripture. Um, and, and to realize that <laughs> there used to be pilgrimages, three of them were commanded of, of Jewish men to go to Jerusalem on three different times, and now the church is worldwide. You can't pinpoint a place on the globe, this is where it's at. You know, this is Mecca, where Islam is. This is Jerusalem, where Judaism was. No, where's Christianity? It's the entire world just going around the globe. 
right? It, that is a holy, holy, that's the body of Christ, a holy thing. And to keep that perspective that Christ is not my homeboy, you know, he certainly is my best friend, but my, my view of friendship needs to elevate. He is my best friend who died for me. He is my Lord. He is my master. He's all these things that the, he's my shepherd. He is my king. He's all these things that the, the scriptures describe him as. Keeping that perspective and never growing too familiar with Christ is going to help us not becoming too familiar with his bride, which is the church. Yeah, he uniquely loves the church in a special way. One of the things I'd encourage you to do is get to know people. Ephesians is really clear about our need for one another. And the Lord has sovereignly placed us in this fellowship together. But what happens is, as we come in and we get real comfortable with our group of friends that we know, take someone out to eat that you, you don't know really, really well. Go hang out with people and find out who they are. You'll be shocked about uh, the, the life stories of people even in this church and how gifted they are. Um, you need the church. We need the church. We need one another. We're the body of Christ. So, Yeah, and I, I think to... Uh Corey, you made a point earlier about how our growth, it, it should really come from the outside perspective. Mm -hmm. And then our need, it, it also having that accountability that, that comes from those deep past the superficial level, right? We all have superficial relationships. Hey, how are you? Great. See you next Sunday. But when we actually know one another, then we can say, hey, I, I see you, you're kind of dry. Mm -hmm. Right, but I don't know that if we haven't spent time mm -hmm. to get to know one another. Mm -hmm. And that there's there in and of itself is a safety net mm -hmm. for each other to never mm -hmm. become too familiar with God. Yeah. Amen. Because we've all seen those news stories where somebody some tragic, horrific accident happens in some house and the neighbors being interviewed and I didn't even know he had a problem. I never even see him. You know, those types of things. We never talk. That should never be said of us as Christians in the church. You know, not that we need to be nosy bodies and annoyingly in each other's lives, you know, to the, to the point ad nauseum. But there's a there's a common sense factor like, hey, are you, I just want I just want to let you know you're I haven't seen you in a while. Are you doing OK? This is not a judgmental thing. I just want to check in with you because I love you and just leave it at that. And doing things like this, you know, Shannon, and I've talked about this several times. I, I usually I describe this just the power of the ask. Just ask someone how they're doing. You know, most, most times it's, yeah, I'm fine. And, but there's going to be that one time that actually might make a difference and they really needed just someone to ask. Um, never underestimate the power of the ask and just, you know, making sure that, we're, that we're, what we really do, we're showing our love to the invisible God by showing it, manifesting it to those in front of us who we can see. Many of you have received phone calls from me on a Sunday afternoon because as I'm preaching, I can do a kind of mentally gather who's here and who's not here. And so sometimes if I recognize that you're not here, I'll call you and I'll say, hey, how you doing? We missed you. Um, part of the reason I do that is because um, I feel like God has called us to watch over your souls. just want to make sure you're okay. The other reason is to model for you. You should be doing that to one another. As you guys come to church on Sunday and you see, hey, so-and-so isn't here, call them as you're on your drive home. Hey, didn't see you, just wanted to make sure. It's like Corey said, we're not trying to be busy bodies and, you know, to ad nauseum try to know every detail of people's lives but just tell people hey thought about you didn't see you hope you're doing okay so that's a great thing to do I appreciate that when people do that for me yeah, you think about the loneliness in the world mm -hmm. should, there should never be a loneliness in the church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right because of the fact that the loneliness in the world makes sense because everyone who loves one another is in it for selfish means in the church, we are to selflessly love one another. Yeah, yeah. And so the power of the ask, that means I'm about to enter into uncomfortable times. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable to ask questions or to get past, you know, comfortable superficiality, mm -hmm. right? But the, the power of those relationships is where you actually have an opportunity to be stirred on to love and good deeds. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it keeps us, uh, it, it requires a degree of vulnerability. Yes. And which is always uncomfortable. Yeah. I would actually equate humility with vulnerability is how I would define it. These are synonymous terms. Humility is not something you grow into. Otherwise, you're not being humble, I guess, you know. It's really being vulnerable. Here, I'm exposed. You know my issues. And now, <laughs> who am I to have pride now? It's, very, it, it's, it's the Lord on the cross being yeah. extremely vulnerable. 
um, we have to be that way with one another, um, or it's just going to be it's going to stay superficial. So when not just asking someone, but actually caring, and and prayerfully that person's going to be honest and actually say what's going on in their lives or something, you know, because um, there's a lot of I think in the church there's a lot of guilt that happens where we have to hide our our trauma. You know, we're ashamed of it when it's like, no, this is actually the place where there's no there's no place on earth um, where you can more freely bear those burdens and let me as your brother or as sisters to one another um, help you bear some of that. That's exactly what the church does to build each other up. <clears throat> yeah, the, the world has so in the, in the world that we live in has so created this individual space, right? This this picture that I get to create of who I am that is so private and you get desensitized to actual relationships because that, that causes you to branch out and, and bear those fruits with one another. Uh, well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for all of the preparation that you have put in over these last five weeks um, and just um, coming here and teaching us about biblical literacy. Hope, church, you thought that was helpful.